Shun, I want to invite uh, one of the leading experts of robotic percutaneous coronary interventions, not only in the United States, but in the world, Dr. Erisham Mahmood. He is the professor and director of cardiovascular medicine at the University of California, San Diego. It's an immense pleasure to invite him today. And Mahmood, I hope your laptop plugs in. That's and, what, that's what if, if robotics work, this should probably this work. This should definitely. Yeah. If this doesn't work, we can go to plan B and uh, just go and demonstrate how it works outside. Let's see. I think this should do the trick. Well, while we're getting set up, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come out here. This has really been okay. Um, a fantastic meeting thus far, and I also credit all of you on a long weekend to come and learn about interventional cardiology. We all are obviously dedicated to the field and feel that uh, you can never get enough of those 10,000 hours, but I'm glad that the rest of you th feel the same way. All right, uh, <clears throat> I have 10 minutes, so I'm going to go relatively quickly. My uh, disclosures, the most relevant ones, are I have clinical trial and research support as well as consult for Corindus, the manufacturer of the robotic system that I'll be talking about. When you think of PCI or even peripheral vascular interventions, we've had over the last 30 years tremendous advances in how we can deliver state-of-the-art stent technology, uh, device technology, pharmacotherapies that are now available to us such that we can routinely perform outpatient coronary interventions. However, if you think about the actual technique, there's really not a whole lot different today than 30 years ago as to how the procedure is actually performed. This is, the this is what the Corindus vascular robotic system looks like. There's an operator console that can be placed in the lab, it can be placed in the control room, or actually, as long as you hardwire it at the present time, you can place it outside of the cath lab. The robotic cassette is at the left bottom, and I'll talk a little more about that. That's mounted table side along with a robotic drive that gets connected to the guide catheter, and then you remotely can both advance and retract guide wires and balloons and stents. This is what the single-use cassette looks like that's mounted uh, table side with the robotic drive, and you have an ability to put two guide wires, one that goes down the middle of the robotic drive, and one that's a side wire so that if you have a bifurcation lesion, you can address it. Here's how you attach it. So you engage uh, manually the guide catheter. Once it's engaged, you are then able to connect the TUI into the robotic drive. You close that robotic drive, and now you're ready to go. And when you're ready to go is you can control, you have two controls table side, the right controls to advance and retract the guide wire as well as to direct it, while the left control is to m advance or move back balloons and or stents. And we've also been uh, investigating how we can deliver contrast from the robotic drive, and that's one of the things exemplified here. So why? Why are we even thinking about it? There are two uh, potential benefits whenever you look at new technology in the interventional space. One, you have to think about at the patient level. So are there things that can improve or may ensure that there's no adverse effect with respect to patient safety, as well as device precision, which is one of the roles that robotics could play. And secondly, from a physician standpoint, occupational hazard reduction, and I'll talk about both of them. So first, as far as patient safety is concerned, the pivotal trial or study is called the PRECISE trial. It was published in Jack in 2013. It was a straightforward, simple lesion uh, trial just to demonstrate the safety and feasibility of performing robotic PCI in coronary lesions. So the lesions had to be short, covered by a single stent. Any complex lesions were excluded. Average lesion length is 12 millimeters, and the vast majority are non-type C. Device success was 99%, procedural success, which meant that you were able to complete the procedure without a major adverse event, or uh, is 98%. Four patients had a periprocedural MI. There were no major adverse events in this <coughs> trial, and this led to the FDA approving this technology. So from a patient level uh, benefit, first, there's no issue with safety in simple lesions. What about any additional patient level benefit? Now, here's a lesion 
that if you ask a series of interventional cardiologists or invasive cardiologists, they might give you a range anywhere from 15 to 20 millimeters. Uh, with this technology, you can actually identify proximal and distal fiduciary points, and it will give you exact lesion length. And that takes into account tortuosity, uh, so that when you're deciding on a particular stent, uh, you are able to avoid the risk of geographical miss and therefore long-term adverse effects with higher restenosis. Now, most people will say, and most interventional cardiologists feel that they really don't need any such tools. Uh, their eyes are better than quantitative angiography, and we decided to test that hypothesis by having 20 interventional cardiologists look at a series of uh, angiographic images and then matched it with QCA. And it turns out that probably my kid's better than uh, most interventional cardiologists. The green line is the actual number or the range that you should be in. And I really don't want to be number 14, and I won't tell you who number 14 is, but you can see that uh, there's a huge variability when individuals are asked to so-called eyeball a lesion and then figure out what size stent. So sometimes you put too short a stent, you have to put a second stent, or you end up putting too long a stent, and then you have, even in the DES era, um, higher risk of restenosis. What about physician-level benefit? And this is probably where this technology at the present time has the greatest potential benefit. The big thing about radiation, uh, there are two major <coughs> risks when you, have, when you think of radiation injury. One is what's called stochastic, probabilistic. What this means is it's the probability which is completely random. So a single exposure could put you at risk. Or this is unrelated to exposure altogether. It's a random event. It is the non-stochastic or deterministic risk that is of much greater concern or is the controllable risk for all of us. The more exposure, the higher the risk. And interventional cardiologists, it turns out, are within the medical specialties, receive the highest amount of radiation. And Dr. Subhash Banerjee, sitting to my left, loves to do radials. He also loves to do peripherals. And so I'm worried about him because he <laughs> Uh, is not only exposing himself first by doing radials, but secondly by doing below the knee, upper limb, and pelvic interventions because individuals' overall exposure and eye exposure is two to three-fold greater than PCI for people who do peripheral vascular interventions. And this is a sobering study uh, recently published showing in a very methodical manner, uh, and this was of all cath lab staff, and it turns out that left-sided carotid IMT thickness is greater in the highest exposure cath lab workers, physicians and staff. The other component, and it's a detailed study, and I won't go into all of that, but the red as the, uh, on the right side of the slide are the high uh, exposure workers. But the other finding in this study was that those same individuals had reduced telomere uh, length, meaning premature aging. You also might have heard about this head and neck tumors reported uh, in interventional physicians. And in fact, it was initially four cases, and now the series is uh, well over, I believe, last count, uh, close to 50 patients or 50 individuals. The vast majority have been interventional cardiologists, and the vast majority of head and neck tumors have been left-sided, and the vast majority have been glioblastomas. And so as rare as the event is, and it's not obviously controlled, uh, i.e., we don't know what the overall prevalence within that population would have been. Nevertheless, this is something of concern, and we decided to look at whether or not there's a differential in radiation exposure for operators. And so we looked at, uh, over six months, all of our interventional fellows as well as attendings participated in this study, and we uh, measured radiation exposure to the left, front, right side of the cranium. We also wore a radiation protection cap and measured inside the cap. And the bottom line finding of this study is that left side of your cranium, for, when you work in the cath lab, is exposed to 16 times greater radiation than the right side. And the front of the cranium is 11 times more exposed. And now, this cap is very, very protective. Nevertheless, most of us don't wear these caps. So these are all sobering data. What about 
the benefits of robotic PCI, and when you look at the precise study where radiation exposure to the operators was measured, this is the amount at the procedure table, and the median exposure to the operators is reduced by 95 percent. So when you're not at or close to the site of exposure, obviously you're not going to get exposed. As far as ergonomic superiority, well, that's my fellow table side. That's my tech who now loves robotic PCI because he can sit back there and daydream and do whatever else he wants to do. And that's me in the operator console. And what we now do is once it is attached and hooked up and ready to go, the fellow steps back as well. So it is ergonomically superior because you're not wearing lead, you're not being exposed, and you're in a protected field. I showed you data that robotic PCI is approved and from the precise trial in simple, straightforward lesions. What about complex clinical presentations and complex lesions? Let me show you an example of a case. Uh, we've now done a number of uh, so-called chip lesions. Uh, Impella supported high-risk PCI robotically, but this is the first one we've ever done. A 59-year-old uh, dialysis-dependent uh, patient, post-bypass surgery, all her grafts are down. Uh, seven months before this intervention, I had uh, done rotational atherectomy throughout her LAD and stented it. She now comes back with a large anterior ischemic defect, and what she has is a distal left main lesion as well as a prox LAD instant restenosis. Her right's occluded, her mid circ is occluded. We went ahead, placed an impella, and the guide catheters in here, and this entire case was done robotically where we went ahead and uh, put a wire in the circumflex and balloon dilated it. We also had a wire down the uh, LAD, pre-dilatation, that's after the pre-dilation, <coughs> stented the distal left main into the prox LAD with a wire in the circ, took out the circ wire, high pressure post-dilation, and that's our final result. And now we've done a series of cases both with and without uh, hemodynamic support affecting the left main uh, with the robot. Here's another example. Uh, it's a patient with uh, three-vessel coronary disease, left ventricular dysfunction, osteal circ, osteal LAD, prox right, and with uh, impella hemodynamic support, uh, it was, uh, the entire procedure was done robotically. So uh, this is just, I'm just going to show you one slide of our complex robotic-assisted uh, PCI trial. We actually have uh, just over 300 patients enrolled. Uh, with uh, a two-thirds, one-third match, two-thirds are manually done, one-third are robotically done. These are the robotic cases or the robotic arm of the trial. 75% were type C lesions, uh, 108 cases, 157 lesions. We have basically treated all types, CTOs, vein grafts, osteal lesions, left main bifurcation, hemodynamically supported. We were able to do 82% completely robotically. 10% required some manual assistance, which meant more than 90% of the case was done robotically, but it might have required a component of it. 8% converted to manual. There was one osteal guide catheter dissection, six periprocedural MIs, and the most common reason, and we're going to present these data at ACC, uh, were really we needed additional guide catheter support. When you look at time comparison, robotic versus manual, for low complexity lesion, now this is an important finding, so we categorized all our lesions to low, intermediate, and high risk. Virtually, you could be a type C lesion and still be in the low category. I won't go into how we categorize them, but the bottom line is intermediate and high complexity lesions, the robotic procedure time was exactly the same as manual, but for the relatively straightforward lesions, a robotic actually took longer, probably longer setup time. So that was my first case ever. I was paranoid about it, so I made sure I had my lead and I was... Uh, in a, in a good, ready-to-go environment. That's how I do it now. And, <laughs> and now every time I have a robotic case, I show up and the fellows actually have a cup of coffee sitting there on my table, which I'm not sure is a good idea. I do want to talk a little bit about the peripheral aspects. I know I'm running out of time, but I'm going to finish real quick, which is we also just completed the rapid trial, which is uh, the evaluation of a robotic platform for peripheral interventions. And uh, we were not able to do it in the United States, so we went to Austria and did it. And here's an example of a patient that we did. Distal SFA pop, dilated, stented, and that's the final result. And it, we just did, it, it's, it was a feasibility study, did 20 patients, it was all successful, and I think that should enable us to get uh, FDA approval to be able to do robotics in the peripheral vasculature as well. 
So robotic PCI's advantages, reduces occupational hazards. It's a natural extension of an individual's skills. With precise positioning of the balloon and stent, you could, have, you could limit longitudinal geographical miss. You can indirectly control the guide catheter with the current platform. You need a little more aggressive guide catheter and supportive guide wires to effectively use the robot for complex and peripheral interventions. And I think the future will require an over-the-wire platform. Currently, it's RX. And an 035 platform. The current platform is 014 to 018. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.